Well, good morning again. I want to begin by reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to read uh, just three verses, 7 through 10. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, much has been said and theorized about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Um, and, and that's not going to be the focus of, of us this morning. But I think it's important that at least we touch on it enough so that you know, we, we get the context of what Paul is, is writing about. Now, um, Paul didn't give a whole lot of details uh, it, it stands to reason that the Corinthian church that he was writing to probably knew what it was that he was dealing with. And so as a result, he didn't go into detail. He just he's talking about it. And, um, it, you know, it, it's probably best that he didn't get specific, because if he had been specific, then we would say, well, that uh, the situation that Paul talks about only applies to this circumstance. And because it's left open, then we can take what Paul is teaching and we can apply it to all hardship, all struggle, all difficulty. Now, most people assume that it was a physical ailment of some sort. Uh, when you look at the commentaries, there are no less than eight different theories suggested on what Paul was dealing with. A uh, couple of interesting side, you know, side notes. The word thorn could actually more accurately be translated as steak. Now, I know it's almost lunchtime, so I'm not talking about, you know, a dead cow. I'm talking about a big dagger. Uh, you know, it, instead of a, a little thorn, it was a massive steak. And what he's, he's communicating is the intensity of suffering that, that this was causing him. This wasn't a, a little mild issue. This was a major problem, a major pain. And notice that it was inflicted by Satan. Also, when it's translated thorn in my flesh, you could just as easily translate it thorn because of my flesh. And that actually changes the, the whole mindset there. It, rather than it being a physical ailment or of something like that, he, he's actually dealing with uh, something due to his old nature, his old sin nature. You know, maybe it's pride or arrogance or ego or something along those lines when you think about the context that he's talking about. So what he's saying is a messenger from Satan was tormenting him in his old sin nature. Now, again, the context, Paul is writing about the fact that he has received all of these great visions and, and that God had, has appeared to him and, and showed him many miraculous things. And so if anybody ever had cause to be prideful, it was him. And so because this was a, a struggle that he was dealing with, a messenger of Satan has been allowed to attack him, to, to torment him. And in his flesh, in his, his old sin nature, it, that, that old nature is rearing its head. Now, this is important for us to understand. Paul, remember, is the guy who wrote, and we know that God causes everything to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. 
So the question pops up, well, what good possibly can be found in intense suffering? Well, in this case, as Paul tells us, that the, the torment, the, the suffering was to keep him grounded, to keep him humble. So let's understand that Paul's thorn was a demonic attack sent to torment him. And that Paul uses the, the word messenger from Satan. And that word that he uses for messenger is the exact same word that we use for angel. So uh, like the contemporary English version even says, one of Satan's angels was sent to make him suffer terribly so that he would not feel too proud. Now, again, how can a satanic attack result in everything working together for good? I, you know, that, that seems uh, kind, of, kind of at opposite ends. Well, remember, and, and one of my favorite quotes from Charles Stanley is, whatever drives you to your knees, whatever drives you to God, is actually a blessing. And this is how we need to understand Paul's situation. Paul is being used by God in great ways, in miraculous ways. The gospel message is going out far and wide. And Paul, through his connection with God, through his, his intimacy with God, he is receiving wonderful, miraculous insights he, and visions and, and, and wisdom and understanding. God is clearly using Paul. And so it would be easy for Paul to be arrogant. You know, again, Paul was human. And so it would be really easy for Paul to kind of say, hey, I'm, I'm pretty special. I, I'm an important guy. God needs me, right? You know, that would be a natural slippery slope to, to slide down. And so it, this is so important to understand. Did God know Paul was under attack? Did God allow Paul to undergo this hardship? Absolutely yes. We need to understand God allowed Paul to be tormented. Now, again, this flies in the face of a lot of modern theology that God wants you healthy, wealthy, rich, and life is easy peasy. And, and that is not at all what we get here. You know, remember Job? If you re go back and read Job chapter 1 and 2, the whole point is that God allowed Satan to attack Job so that God's purposes would be accomplished. We have to remember it's about God. It's not about us. We can't ever, ever allow our minds to begin to think that God exists to keep us happy. We exist to glorify God. And we have to keep that balance or else what we're doing is we're putting ourselves on the throne and we're telling God, I'm sorry, but I'm more important than you are. And that just, that just doesn't fly. Bible has a lot to say about blasphemy. And that's exactly what that is. It's idolatry when we begin to put ourselves before God. So God allowed Paul to be attacked. Uh, again, remember in Genesis uh, 50 where Joseph, remember good old Joseph? He was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was thrown into prison and wrongly accused. He was forgotten in prison. And remember what it was he said to his brothers in 50 verse 20. What you intended for evil, God intended for good. Understand God allowed, and we could even go so far as to say God ordained Joseph's suffering. 
So this is critical for us to understand as we're looking at Paul and how we want to apply this to our own lives. We have to learn and we have to doggedly hold on to the fact that everything that happens in our lives, God has allowed. And remember this, and this is where theology becomes so important because God is good, because God cannot do evil, everything, 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 even if it appears evil, God is able to use it for good. And so when you are going through hardships, when you are going through difficulties, when you're going through challenges, you have to remain steadfast. You have to keep your mind fixed on, on these truths or else you'll get sucked down a pipe that, that where you begin thinking, why did God, why does God hate me? Why did God turn his back on me? Why did God abandon me? God hasn't done any of those things. When we turn to God and trust God, He can fulfill Romans 8.28. But remember, here's the clause at the end of those who love God and are called according to His purposes for them. You know, um, it, it's important. This is probably one of the most misquoted verses in all of the Bible. And we need to understand that everything does not automatically turn out for good. You know, uh, um, <laughs> there are people all over the place who have had their lives absolutely ruined and destroyed by some, some event, by, by something. And it has destroyed their lives. Everything didn't turn out for good because they didn't love God and they weren't called according to His purposes. Now, we need to understand that. And I'm not, you know, I, I, let's don't get into the habit of going around saying, well, bad stuff happened to you because God doesn't love you. Or, you know, or because you don't love God enough. Let's don't put that guilt on people. Let's help people have the connection to Jesus Christ. And when we have the connection to Jesus Christ, God can sort out how all of that turns out. But our, you know, we need to understand that, this verse requires for us to love God and be pursuing after God's purposes. Now, Paul says that he was, he was attacked, that he, he had this messenger from Satan attack him to keep him from becoming arrogant. Why? Due to the extraordinary nature of his revelations. I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me so that I wouldn't become too arrogant or, or too proud. So let's, let's apply this. Let's, let's take what Paul is teaching us and, and use it for our own lives. First thing, he says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. First of all, Paul did exactly what you and I should do whenever you have hardship. He prayed. Boy, that is the beginning point for everything. If you stub your toe, you pray. If you get a thorn in your pinky, you pray. Everything, we pray. That should be the beginning point. Three times Paul comes to God and, and understand, he, he implored, he diligently sought, he begged God. He poured his heart out to God. And here's a case, again, where Paul could very easily justify and say, you know what, God, you're really using me in a big way right now. I need to be at 100%. I need to be firing on all my cylinders. I don't need anything holding me back. And, and I, I need to be at the top of my game. And, and again, isn't that exactly what we do? We come to God 
and we say, God, I, I, I can't be sick right now. I have too much going on. I, I can't have distractions in my life. I, I, need, I need to be solid right now. I, I need to be stable. I need to be focused. I need perfect peace. I need the house clean. I need my bills paid. I need everything to be just perfect. And God says, sorry, doesn't work that way. Three times Paul prayed, and three times God gives him the same answer. You don't need anything except me, my grace. You know, and, and again, we often view grace as this principle or a concept Remember that grace is God's undeserved love, His undeserved acceptance of us, His undeserved approval of us. And the thing is, is we, we don't see grace in a tangible way. But the reality is, is grace is the very essence of, of what makes Christianity different from other religions. Our God is a God who is a gracious God. In John 1 verse 16, it says, From Christ's fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Everything about the Christian life is bathed in grace. And so let's spend a little time understanding when, when God says, My grace is, is enough. My grace is all you need. What does he mean by that? Well, in John 1, verse 17, the very next verse, it says, For while the law was given through Moses, in other words, you know, remember the law was you have to keep a bunch of rules. You have to, you have to follow you know, everything just precisely. Grace, which is the, again, the unearned, undeserved favor, and all the spiritual blessings as well as truth came to us through Jesus Christ. There is nothing in the Christian life that you don't already have, and it was given to you by Jesus. That's what is so important for us to understand. Everything is available to you in Jesus Christ. That's grace. You know, uh, all the faith you need. All the joy you need, all the hope you need, all the strength you need, all the power, the patience, the truth, the wisdom, discernment. Everything you need is already being given to you in Jesus Christ. It, um, just some examples. In Acts chapter 4, referring to the new believers, it, the Bible says that abundant grace was upon them. Paul wrote in Romans 5, grace in which we stand. James spoke in James 4 of the grace that is greater than our sin. I think there's even a song about that. Uh, 1 Peter 4 says, God has shown you His grace in many different ways. So be good servants and use whatever gift He has given you in a way that will best serve each other. Paul refers to grace as the superior grace God has given you in 2 Corinthians 9. Now here's the sad reality. Too often, we either don't understand, or we don't appreciate, or we just flat out reject what has been given to us in Christ. Understand that grace for the Christian is like the air we breathe. It is, we are awash in grace. And, and, and here's the thing, because we are so often so focused on the world and on the world's allure, we miss or we just flat out reject the, the grace of Christ. You know, we, we substitute humanistic, godless approaches and godless solutions that the world is throwing out there rather than accepting and embracing what God is giving to us. And, and, you know, when things don't go the way we think they ought to go, some problem 
arises and we probably do pray. We say, God, take this away. I don't want it. And so, you know, as soon as God doesn't answer that the way we think he should, we seek the world's solutions to it. And as a result, what that does is that makes us become even more distant to Christ and, it be, and we become more... Re, re, what's the word I'm looking for? We become more resistant to embracing what Christ has for us. You know, our, our finances get into a mess. And so rather than apply God's principles, we turn to what the world recommends or our marriages get in a mess. And in, instead of applying God's principles, we turn to the world's solutions. And, and you know, it, it, we do that with our emotional health, with our business practices, with our ethics, with our politics. Our, we, we approach life by what the world says, and then we wonder why this God thing isn't working right in our lives. We have to understand that we're going to have hardships and difficulties and problems and pain and suffering. And Paul is specifically talking about the suffering that came because he was serving Christ. And, and again, the sad reality is, is most of us are not serving Christ. And so we're out in the weeds and we're getting into problems and we're thinking, well, where, where's Jesus in all of this? Well, that's the problem is we aren't pursuing Jesus. We, we place our trust in things like psychology. You know, psychologists, for the most part, are, are godless individuals. And certainly if you look at the people who came up with psychology, you know, people like Freud and all of them, they were godless, wicked people. And they've come up with these theories and now we're trying to apply them to, to Christians? I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's nuts. We have no business pursuing the world's solutions. Let me say this plainly. Can I see a show of hands this morning if you have a problem? It's pretty unanimous. And those of you that aren't raising your hands are just liars, right? Um, you know, just understand, if you have a problem, Jesus Christ is your answer, period. You don't need to go somewhere else. Now, I can hear some smart aleck sitting out there saying, so if I have a flat tire, does that mean Jesus is going to fix it? Yes, that's exactly what that means. Because if you have a flat tire, here's how it goes. You pray about it because when you have a problem, the first thing you do is you pray. And God very likely, very possibly could send somebody to help you fix that tire. Now, while you're sitting there praying, look up in the rearview mirror of your car. And if God doesn't send someone, the person you see in that rearview mirror is who God is sending to fix that tire. <laughs> Either way, praise the Lord, right? My grace is enough. What we need to do is break away from this mindset that God is sitting up there like a faithful puppy waiting for us to call him so he can come and tidy up and fix our lives. That is not the way Christianity works. Way, the way it works is he is the God of the universe. And so when you are stumbling and bumbling through life, and you come across difficulties and hardships and problems and pain and suffering, you look to the God of the universe. And when you're looking to the God of the universe, He will guide you through those problems. Now, let me give you a, 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 an example. There's a, a saying out there that says that cock is the carpenter's best friend. I was talking to with Jake just a few minutes ago, and he said that when he used to work construction, the painters would say, a little cock and a little paint 
make a carpenter what he ain't. And so think of the fact that, you know, when there's, when there's a, when you miss in the, your molding is a quarter inch too short, or, you know, you, you bang a hole and, and there's a hole or whatever, well, a little cock covers all that up. Well, this is kind of the way we can understand grace. You and I are never able to do anything perfectly. We are broken people. There is no such thing as perfect. And so when we do anything at all, here it is. And it falls short. But God's grace is like cock. It covers up. It makes up the difference for us. Now, just stay with me for a moment. Absolutely nothing we do apart from the Holy Spirit is going to last or is going to matter. We Please hear this. When we and every single one of us is going to stand before God one day and we are going to be judged for, for our actions, for our behavior, everything we did in our own human strength it doesn't matter if by the world standards, it was a huge success. If we did it on our own apart from God, it's going to be burned up. It's going to go away. Now, the other side of this is when we function in the Holy Spirit, anything and everything we do matters. Remember, Jesus says, if you give a cup of water in my name, it matters. It's like you gave it to me. So we need to understand that your, your skill set, you do the best you can, but understand that you're doing it for Christ. You're not doing it for, for humans. Remember when, when, if you've had little ones and they would draw you a picture and they would bring this picture to you and you'd say, oh, that's so nice. Tell me about it. And what you're really doing is saying, I have no idea what this is. I just, I'm, I'm getting you to tell me. And so they'd say, well, it's a picture of you and me and we're eating ice cream. And it's like, all right, I like that. Thank you. Was the picture good? Absolutely not. It was trash, but it was beautiful because it was given from a heart of love and in a heart that was genuine. Well, when we come to God, it's like those pictures. The best we can do from God's perfect standard is not all that great. But when it's done in the Holy Spirit, it's done out of love. And it's done in a way that God looks at it like any proud parent and says, I love this. You make me so happy. You know, our best is not going to be good enough. But if it's done in the Holy Spirit, then it matters. And this is where grace comes into play. God sees our feeble efforts. But when it's done in love under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, God beams with pride and joy at our, our efforts. So getting back to Paul, Paul is saying I get what God is after. The more dependent I am on God, the better it is. The more I recognize my hardship as an opportunity to be dependent on God, then the better it is. And so I am going to embrace hardships. I'm going to embrace the difficulties we have got to break out of this mindset that says, all I want is life smooth and easy, easy peasy. You know, that we've got to get away from that because God wants us to live dependently on Him. And if that means that we need to be broken, we need to be broken. Remember, Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pull it out. You know, he's, he's saying, you need to do what you need to do. Think of the cross of Jesus. 
This is the length that God is willing to go to fix sin. He was willing to go to a cross and die on that cross to accomplish what needed to be accomplished. You know, we work from a perspective of, I'm only going to do what I absolutely have to, and then we'll just see how it all works out. And God says, uh-uh, let's tear this sucker down if that's what needs to be done. Think of Noah's flood. You know, what did, what did God say? I am not happy with what's going on here. I'm going to wipe it out and we're going to start over again. And then he did that with Jesus. You know, think of it this way. Do you make your children do chores? Do you make your, you know, do you give kids responsibilities? Yes. Why? So that they learn how to be responsible. So that they learn to do what needs to be done. God is doing the same thing with us. We need to learn trust and dependence. And, and as I stated earlier, God is good. There's nothing evil about him. So if he is allowing suffering in your life, if he's allowing hardship, if he's allowing difficulty, it's for our good to build us into more godly, dependent individuals. Anything that drives us to him is a blessing. And that's exactly what Paul says. God's power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that, there, that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and hardships and persecutions, troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Remember I told you last week, God's economy is a paradox. If you want to be first, you're going to be last. If you want to be strong, be weak. If you want to be a leader, become a servant. That's the way it works. When you have hardship, run to Jesus. Use the hardship to draw you closer to Jesus. I had a show of hands and everybody, except for those of you that were liars, everybody had, everyone admitted that you had problems. Use those problems to drive you to Jesus and go to the word of God to find what the Bible teaches you about what problem you're dealing with. If you're dealing with marital problems, the Bible has advice. If you're dealing with financial problems, the Bible has advice. If you're dealing with health problems, the Bible has advice. I don't care what you're dealing with. The Bible has your answers through Jesus Christ. Don't run from suffering and hardship. Let God's grace carry you through it. Let's pray. Father, we need you. Sometimes we think we don't. And those are the times when we need you the most. God, help us to come to the end of ourselves and to understand that you and you alone are the answer to everything that we're dealing with. It doesn't matter what it is we're dealing with, Lord. I know that you are the answer. Show us, Father, how to walk in faith and to become reliant on you. God, in our humanness, I, I know that we don't like to rely on others. We want to do it ourselves. But the truth is, it is only in you that we can find true peace, true happiness, true success. Help us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.